All right. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, our second attempt at the, uh, the Spider-Man Far From Home commentary. This will round out our series of audio commentaries for all of the Spider-Man movies. Uh, this is coming a bit late, so I imagine there are some of you who are not aware of the rest of those or haven't listened to them, so go ahead and do that either before or after you listen to this one. We'd much appreciate it. But uh, yeah, we, we, we attempted to do this like a month or so back when the movie first uh, got home released. But, um, you know, this, the, the landscape for the character was kind of different at the time. And uh, we just decided that we'd do this one over. You know, it's, it's, it didn't quite have the spark that the other commentaries have. So here's hoping that we circumvent that problem this time. So uh, the way things work around here, if you want to watch the movie along with the commentary, then uh, we'll let you know. Just get your copy of the movie at timestamp zero. And when we give you the signal, press play. And uh, yeah, if there's no further ado to be had, then you can go ahead and do that in three, two, one. So uh, the way that we usually open these is like talking about how we felt about them coming out of the theater. How was that uh, for you? I really enjoyed this movie quite a bit. As I said, I don't have, um, well, I mean, I have my reservations about this movie, certainly. I don't think it's as good as Homecoming, but I do think um, that they nailed the villain just as well. And well, maybe not just as well, but like Mysterio is perfect. Like I, uh, I really like, um, I'm a blank on the actor. Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, I really like Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, I thought he was great, and I liked uh, the uh, the action. I, I thought they they upped the action um, more so in the in the later scenes than our, our first few action beats. But uh, the action was upped. I like that we, we have Peter dealing with um, Tony's death here, and that we. Uh, like this, this, this does feel like a pretty solid epilogue to Endgame. Of course, this does yeah. come out after. Um, but overall, leaving the theater, I, I felt satisfied. Yeah, and um, it's really we'll talk about this more later because it's going to come up. I feel like later, but we'll. It's especially kind of impressive the degree to which this is an effective epilogue to Endgame, given how little about Endgame was actually known in the process of making this movie. But um, me coming out, I really enjoyed it. I was unsure and honestly remain unsure if I prefer it to Homecoming. But um, a lot of people that I follow and who follow me on like social media and stuff are like big Spider-Man fans and this movie like naturally remains a constant sort of talking point and it's in talking with these kind of people that i've come to appreciate this movie more even as i totally recognize why some people might have major issues with it and i'm sure that we'll touch on some of those as we go but i don't know i think to me this is like homecoming a really really strong character story for peter parker and uh, it definitely has its weaknesses that i'll point out as they sort of crop up, but I don't know. This is one that I, I think I like more the more that I think about it and the more that I talk about it. So, uh, yeah, the, here's hoping that that uh, and um, as this, this opening was certainly jarring for a lot of people, yeah. And like, I, I believe I mentioned this in the last commentary, I don't know to what extent this is really true or if I would have been fine with this opening anyway. But uh, I came into this movie like very soon after having like someone who I associated with in my own middle school die and have like a memorial service at that school. And the result was kind of like earnest, but funny and cheesy in an unintended way, much like that ended up being. And so like, I was like, yeah, you know, this is a bunch of kids making a weird memorial video. It's it, it, it feels earnest. Like I don't mind it. I, I, I can I could see having a bigger problem with it if it felt like they were making a joke out of the fact that they were dead. But no, the joke isn't 
ah ha ha, look, these characters are dead. The joke is that they, they really tried, but you know, they're incompetent kids making this uh, video. Yeah, like in, in that context, it would come off unintentionally funny. Yeah, my problem with it though is, as I mentioned, the fact that they use stock images of those characters, that just feels like a weird choice to me. It, like, it's not, and again, we mentioned this, oh, I said this exact thing, exact thing to you last commentary. It's not weird, it's just lazy. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's a better word for it. It's like, why not just have original photos of those characters to be like, yeah, these were taken diegetically within the world. And uh, immediately, number two on the list of problems that I don't share, but which I totally understand, is uh, Peter uh, having an attraction, uh, attraction to MJ, starting with this movie, when that was not alluded to at all on his end previously. And like, uh, for my part, I'm willing to just accept time past these characters, for better or worse, change off screen, and like when he lays out all the reasons he likes her, I'm like, yeah, that's true. That is who she is. And I buy that like those aspects of her appeal to him, but I totally understand the people who are like, I would have liked to have seen these feelings develop on screen. I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle, but mostly leaning towards your end. Like I, I refer to this as a hard pill for me to swallow. Yeah, that's fair. Just because it, um, because we don't see any, any of that time and it's all, you know, off screen, it, it just. I, and like, I had a whole thing about this uh, in the previous commentary. I might have gone on a little too long. So for now, I'm just going to leave it at it's unfortunate, but it's kind of debatably unavoidable. It's a side effect of these being movies and not TV shows. And. Like, that's the argument that we've heard sometimes from, like, Captain Logan and stuff is, like, if you wanted the ideal version of these stories told, maybe the MCU should be, like, TV as they a... They would have to be TV shows with Netflix budget so you could still pull off all the special effects stuff. Which we might be getting with Disney+. Plus. We'll see how that pans out. We're most certainly getting that with Disney+. Plus. They've already announced how much money they're spending on... <laughs> yeah. episodes for those series and yeah the, there's those shows are definitely gonna have budgets behind them yeah and like um in the co in the homecoming commentary we mentioned that a problem that we have with this peter is that he doesn't feel like enough of a different person uh in the suit as he does when he's out of it um he definitely the, 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 the deleted scene well this yeah this scene is awkward because of that whole thing his interaction with the crowd out there yeah but even I, more so that scene that they cut of him like being really quippy and fighting the uh, the thugs in that restaurant, which mm -hmm. should have been in this movie, mm -hmm. especially because um, like we never really, aside from like the, a brief little snippet um, that Tony Stark shows on his uh, camera when he recruits him in Civil War, we don't really see him fighting crime all that much. Yeah, yeah. it would be nice to know that he's still doing that. Well, I mean, like, I don't know. later, or like to see it. Yeah. Especially because I, later, when um, he's like, I need a break. A break from what? Like, all he does is take some photos and barely even talks to the press, as far as we really know. Like, I, I think we should, that, that little stiff of him fighting the, the thug should have been there. Well, the thing is, I I see where you're coming from, but there are a couple of things that I disagree with. Where like, this is one of those cases where if I were in charge of editing this movie, would I have kept that scene? Absolutely. Do I understand why they took it out? Also, yes. And on the on the note of like, what does he need a break from? I don't know that that scene would have actually changed that at all because. He doesn't seem like he's struggling at all in that scene. Like, part of the appeal of that scene is, like, he's just... that. That is the easy part of his life. Like, the actual taking down the criminals, that's the thing that he is not struggling with. When he says he needs a break, he doesn't mean from, like, the actual physical labor of being Spider-Man and fighting the crime. He needs a that's break fair. from the pressure. And that is conveyed, like, right here. What he needs well, to break from is people's expectations of him. That's true. 
but I also think that scene hammers that home where he's like, you're going to be the new Iron Man now? And his yeah. reaction is to deflect that with a joke. That's true. So I, I, I think the scene still gives us that. Yeah. And like, it would have been a nice little bit of escalation to be like, in that situation, he can deflect that with a joke. But when it's a bunch of people like earnestly asking him that question, he almost like panics over it and he's like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. Just, like, just a, another, another, um, I mean, like, that's, those are the points I'm trying to hit with why they should have kept that scene in. Mm. Um, I think it helps with, with pacing. Like, I just think it helps. Because uh, I think we want to get him like out of country and on the trip as soon as possible. But I just think it would help the movie breathe a little more. And it would give you the whole... Um, well, it would at least give you more of him doing the quips because another major complaint I hear from people with this movie is that he's not quippy enough in this. And the problem is, like, they made a story that doesn't really... Well... Oh, this is funny, and I yeah. like the Peter Thiel thing. Um, I, I think it's a it's a funny like ongoing gag, but he needs to actually call it Spider Sense. That's my whole thing with that. But as far as I was what I was saying earlier, um, he like uh, the, the story, like he fights what he thinks are you know monsters, and he's not going to cook with those because as far as he knows, they don't have any level of sentience. Mm -hmm. really um and he's not going to quip with a bunch of drones and by the time he finds out that beck isn't a good guy he's not even in the costume anymore so it doesn't make sense to call him fishbowl head or anything like that so even though he does yeah. still have a fishbowl head but not the same you can I still know, see his head still. yeah i know still i i would have still had him call him that i think it would have been justified but it's not a problem but yeah this was definitely a case where the, the action scenes, as they pan out, don't really allow for much quippage. And so on that level also, I would have kept that scene. And also just, like, pacing aside, because I personally don't think the pacing is all that hurt by its absence, I just would have liked to have it as, okay, we're getting him out of the country, we're getting him into a new setting, what's he like in his element? And so yeah. it, it creates a nice contrast, because like I said... That stuff is easy for him. That stuff is where he's like at his most confident. It would be nice to contrast that with suddenly giant monsters show up and he's got Nick Fury breathing down his neck and he's got seemingly a more professional superhero in the form of Quentin. And suddenly it's like, oh man, compared to fighting a bunch of mob guys in a restaurant, am I out of my depth here? What's going on? And I would like to know why exactly he's still wearing that suit. Because, you know, I would have thought, like, with him wearing it in the Avengers films, like, he's dealing with a much more high-stakes, um, high-scale situation and fighting aliens and monsters. Like, he's fighting thugs. He does not need Iron Man's suit to fight those thugs. Yeah, you could argue it's like in memory of Tony, but I think that's maybe extrapolating too much. And that's personally... because, like, he he's not trying to, like, every, everyone's expecting him to live up to Tony. Um, and I think partially because he's wearing that suit, and I don't know why. I don't know he's. I don't know why he's still wearing it, even after he's not on an actual Avengers mission and he's just doing his own thing in the city. And like part of that is admittedly more shallow on my end. Like I've gone back and forth on it a lot, but I've firmly decided that I just the the Iron Spider suit is probably my least favorite of his suits in the MCU aesthetically. So, like, I just, I like the homecoming suit a lot, and I'd appreciate it if he was wearing that for at least a scene in this movie, but whatever. And, like, uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, in home uh, in the homecoming commentary, about Ned and his story relevance and the degree to which, like, he's a minor character in this one and off to the side. And, like, that's definitely true. He is definitely a decreased role compared to homecoming. But I do still think that his presence is appreciated, and I think we're doing something interesting with him where uh, I'm going to get into this a lot, but obviously with this being a Mysterio story, the, uh, the, th the theme of this movie is like illusions 
and people putting up walls and like fake images of themselves and sort of pretending. And Ned is the only guy, like the only major character in this movie who's not doing that. Ned is like the one guy out of the principal cast who is completely genuine at all times. And I like that while Peter, who is constantly trying to put up like different facades and stuff, is having relationship issues and like confidence issues. Ned is kind of rewarded by just being a genuine, confident guy in that he just has a relationship that goes smoothly and like they break up on amicable terms and like he has none of Peter's problems. I don't know if he is all that confident or, or necessarily any more confident than Peter is, but um, I feel like he is. Definitely I not, not in coming, but in this movie. Maybe. But I mean, he doesn't seem particularly confident in that moment with um, Becky when he, their hands touch. Uh, I don't know. That was good as like a reaction shot. I I think that's too much to read into. I mean, I I think in general you're reading too much into the Ned thing. I definitely don't think the filmmakers are doing anything really all that interesting with him in this movie. He's kind of just there for comic relief. Eh, yeah. That's his only real function is to be comic relief and to be, you know, Peter's ongoing friend that eventually gets in peril that he has to save. Also, uh, also. I over it, but much like Homecoming, I like the, uh, I like that we use these movies to touch down on what like normal life is and like what, what's the impact of the other heroes and like day to day stuff. And part of that is seeing stuff like, oh, there's a documentary about Tony. There's like a documentary series about discovering Wakanda and the aftermath of the snap. And like, there's a Nova episode by uh, Eric Selvig and like stuff like that is great. That's a neat little, like it, it's like two seconds. It takes up no time in the story. So you can't argue it's like er, forced fan service, but it's a neat little bit of world building of like, okay, this is what the landscape is like because these guys are around. Um, I really hope, and I, I feel like this movie did a solid job of getting Peter finally away from the shadow of Tony Stark. Like, Tony Stark is still a, a pretty major figure and influencer Peter even after his death. Um, and boy, I, I, are, boy, are there people who disagree with that. The idea that uh, this movie gets Peter out of his shadow, but we'll talk about that later. Well, how do you feel about that? I am personally with you. I think I think what this movie is doing is interesting because the people who really dislike it see it as doubling down on the Peter is Iron Man Jr. and like firmly sticking Peter in Tony's shadow. And there's the opposite read, which is that it's getting him out of his shadow and like disassociating him from Tony. And I don't really think the movie is doing either of those things. I don't think what this movie ultimately does with that relationship has anything to do with getting Peter out of that shadow or separating him from Tony or doubling down on making him more like Tony. I think it's about, again, sort of tying into the illusions thing. It's about getting Peter to realize who Tony actually was versus the version of Tony that everyone has in their heads and that everyone expects Peter to live up to. And when we get to the scene that everyone hates, it's like that the point of that scene is not Peter is Tony and it's not that Peter's not Tony. It's that he's spent this whole movie comparing himself to an idea and really he should not have been doing that because Tony was a man and Peter should be comparing himself to the human being, not the idealistic figure. Um, and there's stuff like this that you you only notice on a second or third viewing. Quentin Beck being in the background there. Yep. Which honestly, like, I feel like that makes him even more unnerving. Which just like, he's he's definitely got predator vibes, 
through this whole movie where he literally preys on Peter's emotions. But like the fact that he's literally just there in the corner, like stalking around him and you and Peter don't notice. It's like, oh man, like it's the degree of, like before he's even formally introduced himself properly, before we even know any hint of what his deal is, the degree of control that Quentin Beck has over the narrative that's about to unfold is like, eek, ooh, boy, that's really effective. Um, as out of nowhere, it just feels not having, you know, the, the off-screen context. They have great chemistry. Yes, I agree. I, I, I buy it completely. Like, I honestly, I, I really like their relationship. I wonder to what extent I would like it less if they were different actors. And that's not like a... Like, uh, oh, I'm such a Tom fan. I'm such a Zendaya fan. Like, uh, you make them any character and I'm going to like them more. Like, no, like the two of them together, they have a genuine chemistry that like informs their relationship. And it's like, you know what? Could parts of this have been written stronger? Sure. But also just I like watching these two together. And that makes me care about their relationship more. And yeah, like I have a lot to say about MJ, but uh, yeah, that that will wait for later scenes. But uh, this this bit I like this that's coming up where it's like, why why don't you have the suit? It's like because I'm on vacation, Ned. It's like that's and a he funny wasn't expecting little... to wear it. Yeah, it's like it's such a funny little line, but it's also part of his whole problem is like. And uh, there's a video about this that I think I linked to you that's talking about um, Peter's arc in this movie and like how in Homecoming it was already a problem of like him being torn between the superhero world and him wanting to be a kid. But this movie and like the term that they use for it that I like is that this movie is more implicitly aggressive about it where it's like constantly Peter's like the, the world is basically saying, all right, Peter, pick one. You can't, if you want to go on vacation, then you got to be a kid on vacation. If you're, if you want to be a hero that helps out, then you've got to be constantly prepared for stuff to go down. You can't leave your Spider-Man suit in your room under the pretense of being on vacation and then still try to help and have it be easy. And it's like, that's a constant problem. And it's like, it's part of Peter Parker's identity issues in general. And it's like part of why I think this is a really good story for that character, where it's like two two worlds, like this guy is trying to have it both ways, and that's constantly going to cause problems for him, big and small. Mysterio looks fantastic. Myster everything about Mysterio is perfect. Like his aesthetic is great, his theme is awesome. Like you said, Jillian Hall's performance, like he's top five MCU villains, I think. And like, it's so great, like looking at this movie and basically all of the movies that we've had recently and going like, you remember the days when people were like, the MCU has a villain problem? Yeah. No and like, understand that now with, uh, of course, Mysterio, Thanos, Killmonger, like the, the weakest one we've had in a long time, I think, is like Ghost in Ant Man and the Wasp, and she's not even really a villain. And at least she's like cool and fun to watch. Malekith yeah. is not that. Yeah, like at least Ghost, like Ghost isn't even bad. She's fine. Like she's got a cool power, and she's played, she's like the actress is given a good performance. And like, uh, to, to briefly come back to this movie, uh, I really like that bit with him going through the windows and webbing that stuff up. Like, that shot was the moment where I was like, oh, is this movie maybe going to have better action than Homecoming? Because it's such you a... You seem way more impressed by that than I do. It's um, such I feel a like this whole scene in, in general is just as serviceable as any of the stuff in Homecoming. I don't know. I, something about it really works for me, where... It's not the most impressive, and this movie will definitely get far more impressive, but, like, this stuff with the bell tower, it's, like, it feels more dynamic than a lot of the action scenes in Homecoming. And, again, we talked about this with Homecoming. Part of that is that a lot of those action scenes are just very, very brief, 
So that's a little bit like not to that movie's favor. But I don't know. Like part of this is like the fact that Peter has to sort of run damage control while Mysterio does the actual fighting. Like something about that just works for me. And like for some reason, I don't know what it is. There are some people who despise that thing with him hitting his head in the bell. Like there are some people who are like, oh my god. Too much gag humor. I don't know why. I like that. I think it's a funny gag. It's fine. It's harmless. But there are people who are like, oh, God, it's the most juvenile thing. It's like, really? Really? Like, it's it's such an innocuous little moment to have a problem with, I think. Um, the, There is humor that we talked over. It um, does not work for me at all, like the stuff with the teachers. Yeah, um, almost all of the stuff with the teachers, I'm going to say, doesn't really work for me. And much more so than, like, Homecoming never, like, pretty much never had jokes that had me roll my eyes or gags that had me roll my eyes that I thought could have been cut. This movie has quite a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't, like, roll my eyes at anything. I just, like, don't laugh. And all of that is the teacher hijink stuff. Like, the closest that I get to, like, rolling my eyes is the witches. Like, the running gag with the witches it makes zero sense to me. But uh, before we get too far away from it, I want to say that I do really like that brief moment. And, like, I think that's, especially in hindsight, encapsulates uh, Mysterio and Peter's characters and what makes them different so well. Where it's like, all right, the monster is Mysterio's showboating and um, yeah. worried about being really personal. Yeah, Mysterio's, like, standing there soaking up the attention... And Peter's just happy that his necklace is fine. And like, uh, we discussed this, and I still unfortunately feel this way for as much as my general opinion of this movie gradually increases, Aunt May remains the weakest thing about it. And like, I, my mind has not changed if I could make one change to this movie, like, forget keeping any of the deleted scenes. If I had the power to change one thing, like, from the script, bring her on the trip. Why is she not, like, a chaperone on this field trip? That would immediately, like, give her a lot more to do character-wise. Especially since she knows that he's Spider-Man. Yeah. Um, which, is okay. a, which is a status quo that we usually don't have with Peter Parker, especially this young. Yeah, like I genuinely don't understand. And like you can have you can keep the thing where she's fine and she's like on board and gung ho about him being Spider-Man and maybe like even even use that to draw attention to the thing I was talking about which is like she comes to like she can volunteer to be like a chaperone on the trip and she's like yeah, okay, come on, you're on a trip but you can still be Spider-Man, right? Like fine. And then a giant monster shows up and she's like Oh gosh, maybe not. Like, 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 let's do something interesting where she's like, okay, if you're fighting criminals, that took me a minute, but fine. Like, you've clearly got that in the bag. Giant element monsters, I don't know if I want you doing that. After he's already helped fight, like, two wars. Right, but she, was, but she wasn't there for that. No, but she has to know about that. No, but I mean, they had to have had the conversation where this is what I've been doing all this time that you haven't known about. Right, but part of my thing is like, what would make it more interesting is if, oh, now it's in front of my face, suddenly I get why this is a problem. I I don't don't know if I I buy that for Aunt May. Again, Aunt May is my biggest problem with this movie as well. And with the ending of Homecoming, um, I was so excited about that because I thought it was so much more than just a fun gag to end the movie on. And then like, retro- uh, it just yeah. it just is that. Is right, yeah, it just is that. It's it's nothing. And like to have a, a status quo where she knows that hasn't been explained. Um, yeah. Especially with him that young. Like in Ultimate, there's this whole great issue where um it's towards the tail end of um, Bendis' run where they're just sitting in a kitchen talking and it is one of the best issues in that whole series. 
we don't we don't get any kind of scene like that in this movie and I she really is unfortunately. Yeah. And and the some of this like his his lines here like some of this stuff is is funny when he gets interrupted later yeah no you can you can cut those fury yeah I, I, that's, that's I get just it. About him. It's forced humor and like I'm not gonna lie in the theater this did make me laugh but like it's yeah it's it's one of those gags that I think only works once where after that it's like all right I know what's coming and this is just tedious. And it's one of the one of the things where like it's it's just more cannon fodder for you know these are SNL skits or you know just obnoxious unreal comedy beats that are just thrown into this movie for for mainstream audiences and it 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 feels like the more cynical like studio mandatey kind of thing that's on your movie. Yeah. You know, I Part of a part of like that, but part of it also feels like Homecoming was a very comedic movie, and this being a sequel, we don't want to deviate too hard from that tone. And maybe they overcorrect and go too far in that direction. Especially since this is the movie right after Endgame. Yeah, and like, like when it when it is focused on drama and pathos, that stuff works. And like the comedy, more than I'd argue a lot of other Marvel movies, feels like it's clashing. Like really, at its heart, this movie is not a comedy, and yet it keeps trying to be one. Yeah, in certain scenes. Um, yeah, I, I do wish he was wearing this costume earlier in the movie, doing the the whole uh, the whole fight with the the thugs thing. I wish that scene was still on. But yeah, this, this suit still looks great. Yeah, I just, I like it. I like it so much. I like the one that he has at the end of this one more. But so I, do I. That is, that is now tied with um, the suit from Amazing Spider-Man 2 for my favorite suit that we've had on the big screen. Yeah. I really, really like it a lot. But Can't uh, stop that, wearing it in PS4 either. Yeah, yeah. That said, there's also uh, the Edith glasses and the issue with that, which is debatably less of an issue with this movie, although it still is kind of an issue with this movie, and more of an issue with Tony's character as a whole, which is, when did he make this? Like, it's, it's, After Ultron, does it really make sense for him to? Yeah. Like... Steve Baxi had a good point uh, around the time when this movie came out, which was that Tony's arc was all about learning to finally relax, and he like like this this development makes it so that he was ultimately never able to do that, and it's kind of unfortunate. And also, the problem like in the context of this movie, you gave all of this power to a child, and again like. That that just brings even more the question of when did he make this because he had to have made it like post Infinity War right and Peter would have been dead so why does Peter have access to it there's no way that he made this in the time frame of Endgame no or at least yeah no because there was no way for him to know that they were actually going to win that so. He makes this whole drone system to give to Peter in the event that they do win. Like, and like, there is the line that like, no, Tony, Tony didn't make Edith for Peter, but Peter has access to it. And I'm just like, I, I, I still don't entirely know how that makes sense. Yeah, who all does have access to it? Because if it's not for Peter, who all can access it, and why? Is it just people that he's fought with? Can any of the Avengers access it? Yeah. And like, I suppose the one. The, but, and, and, and Nick says, he said to him on the boat, like, Stark left you these. He also, Stark left you these. Instead of giving it to Cap or, um, I don't know, 
widow or anyone else gives it to Peter. Yeah. But I understand yeah. why Peter says himself why he wouldn't give it to Fury. Cause Although, I mean, we don't know. Maybe he did have, like, Cap and Nat on the list of people to leave it behind for, but they're both um, out of commission, so... That, that problem I don't have, because we don't know enough about the situation to assume that Peter was, like, the first guy who's like, when I die, make sure these get to him. It's like... Well, Nick says, Stark left you these. Oh, yeah, that's true. But again, we'll, that, we'll later... Which means it was for Peter. But then we'll later have a line where Edith herself says, like, no, Tony didn't make me for you. So, I don't know, that's just a weird contradiction. So yeah, that is a weird contradiction. Just Edith is weird. Like, Edith's very existence is strange. And I remain of the opinion, like, now for somewhat different reasons than I felt before, that by the end of this movie, those glasses should be destroyed. Like, I do think, like, it's it's not... It's one of these unintentional things where it's like, obviously, they weren't thinking about it as... They were making the story of this movie because that's not a theme that they were choosing to explore or whatever. But on like on the level of, oh man, this might just be as bad as Ultron, if not worse, if it gets in the wrong hands, the fact that this piece of technology exists, period, is something that the movie should maybe condemn. Well, I mean, this is very different from Ultron in that a person has to control this. These drones aren't sentient and can't just do whatever. Right. But like, I, and like I mean, think, you gotta think about it. Like, I mean, I do think to a degree it does make sense for Tony to make that as opposed to Ultron because a person can control that as opposed to making something sentient and self operating. It would right? be the same thing as if the a bad person got a hold of his armor, like Obadiah, like Obadiah Stane. Right, except that Edith is, and like the the drones that Edith has are just way more dangerous and terrifying than a single Iron Man armor? This would be like I, if someone... I don't even necessarily agree with that. I think... It can literally kill someone. Even playing field. Like, I don't think Tony would have any problem taking on one of those drones that he made in a suit. No, but Tony wow. can't fly from space to any location on the planet in a matter of minutes and kill someone. I like, think he definitely could, given the right suit. In a matter of minutes, I don't think so. I don't think he could be as quick as, as to, like, just, oh, you want someone dead? All right, I'm there. They're dead. No, I'm, I'm not really agreeing with you on that. Like, he made those drones. There's no reason he couldn't put that technology in his armor and do that. Right, but he doesn't. What I'm saying is he could. Like, that doesn't make the drones any more dangerous than one of his suits. Uh, I don't know. I feel uh, like, uh. Speaking but, of which, but this, this this is an interesting way to uh, to tackle the responsibility. <laughs> so that's that's. I mean, that relationship is the best. It's just so dumb. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I agree with that. And like, all of that stuff aside, again, taking these glasses for what they are meant to be, which is like part of Peter's personal growth, I really like them on that responsibility. It, it, and it is, yeah, using them like irresponsibly, like what he tries to do with Brad and like um, stopping him from uh, potentially ruining his chance to get with MJ. That is, you know, inherently selfish and it leads to nearly disastrous consequences. Yeah, and like, it's, it's, we're, we're not quite there yet, but people have a real problem with that scene. I like it. Like, I have a problem with how ridiculously cartoony that scene gets, even for these movies. Like, these movies are supposed to be all the supernatural stuff in the real world, as Marvel was created at its inception, which is why. Yeah. Everything is based in New York and real places as opposed to Gotham or Metropolis. I'll also, before we get to that, because I agree with you, but like, it's also just getting us there with this is pretty contrived. 
like the whole like just have this lady forcefully be like take off your clothes it's like I, uh okay i mean fine but it feels like we just did that as an excuse to then set up the thing with brad it's like fine whatever i guess feels a little forced though yeah which is which again is why i don't feel this movie as a whole is as strong as homecoming at least as a narrative um that movie flows a lot better and i don't feel like I'm looking at any real contrivances or conveniences as far as the story goes. That's fair. Yeah, that's totally understandable. But like, yeah, and um, Brad himself is uh, it's, it's, uh, this is the other like relative to the theme that I mentioned, which is like everyone putting on fronts and everyone kind of having illusions. There's also how that ties in with Peter and MJ's relationship and how Brad factors into that, where he's not a scene goes by with Brad where he's like in conflict with Peter over MJ that doesn't have something to do with the truth and keeping the truth from MJ and like their perception of the concept of truth. And like he's it because on a surface level, and I some people definitely view him this way. Brad could have so easily just been like doing this just to be a jerk and just because he doesn't want the competition. And while I think that's definitely part of it, I do think the character is in part being genuine when he's like, MJ cares about the truth. She deserves to know the truth. You can't just be hooking up with random ladies and also pursuing her. And like, he's totally got the situation wrong, but I think that's an interesting thing for his character especially again in a movie about mysterio where what is real and what is the truth is a constant question but uh, yeah but like like we said this scene i i like i like it for the most part and like let's just say it straight up like <laughs> the problem is baby mountain goats like that's that's the issue yeah like, it's too far yeah and like him punching flash that's great that's like, hilarious, yeah. And like, did you just punch this Flash? Is so, like, I just don't buy this. Like, that, I that all all of them stare at the window like cartoon characters, and like are so eager to see Baby Mountain Goats. Yeah, and it's like it's it's a it's such a shame because I can understand if that ruins the scene for you, but up to that point, I think it's a really good example of like mixing comedy with genuine escalating tension where it's like it's a scene that is full of jokes and full of funny bits that land but also there's a genuine sense of like oh man this is bad how is he gonna stop this and it goes by quick enough that it doesn't feel like it's overstaying it's welcome and like the bit where it's like I again i like it as a bit of escalation where it's like the bit where it's like, do you want me to cancel the drone strike? Uh, hey, did you just punch Flash? No. All right, continuing drone strike. And you, the audience, are there with Peter, where it's like, oh, no, that the, that's not what was supposed to happen. But if they just, they take it that bit too far, and it's like, oh, man, you should have, you should have reined it in just at the end. Um. Homecoming was the first to do this, and this movie's taking it a step further, but I do like um, us getting out of New York City. It, it is a fresh change of pace, because, um, you know, we just, we've never done that before. But <clears throat> for the for the next movie, for the third movie, I hope that that is played like John Wick Chapter 3. That, you know, it picks up right after, and he you now is in the middle of New York City and has to deal with seemingly the whole world, like, finding out who he is, or at the very least thinking they found out who he is. Yeah. At the same time, I, I'm curious to see how they balance that and also furthering or further exploring his relationship with uh, MJ. Yeah. Like, how's he going to do that when he's probably going to be, you know, a bunch of paparazzi trying to follow them and yeah. potentially bad guys and villains following him around and trying to kill him. Maybe that whole movie, like, I'm interested to see what that, what that third movie is and how they pull it off. Yeah. I also like that smash cut when uh from Fury yelling like Parker to him 
than in the room. That's yeah, that's that's really nice editor. Yeah, and it's not something that MCU movies do a lot, where it's like really visually putting us in a character's headspace like that with such a simple little thing. I've been reading a uh, uh, Chip Zdarsky's diary. That's a thing that he does a lot, or like dialogue lead-ins to another scene. Mm -hmm. I think it's really mm -hmm. And again, uh, I mentioned this before, and you don't entirely agree with me on this, but part of what I love about Jake Gyllenhaal is that during the like Mysterio hero scenes like this, I think he's intentionally giving like not his best performance. Like I feel like Jake Gyllenhaal is playing Quentin Beck, playing hero Mysterio as a little bit of a... He's like Quentin Beck is giving a little bit of a hammy performance, a little bit of a slightly wooden performance when he's in these scenes where he's got to fake it. And like I know you don't share that perception, but I think that's I think that's there and I think that's intentional. I think Jillian Hall is like giving good bad acting in these moments. And like again, it's it's not bad. Like Quentin Beck is giving a good performance and like I buy that everyone buys that he's a good guy. But if you're looking out for it, it's like some of his line deliveries are like, yeah, I, I feel like you rehearsed that. Yeah, I'm, I'm still not really with you on that at all. I don't know. I just, I always get that. It's the, the, the line that I get it with especially is when he's like, the only chance we have, the only chance is to stop it here now. It's like, you can tell Quentin Beck was like in front of a mirror saying that line to himself. Is like this is gold. Weirdly enough, that's the one spot I think where I do agree with you. That mm -hmm. line feels that line reading in particular feels a little hammy. But pretty much everything else, like this this entire scene, I think it's all very, very genuine. Like you and me knowing comments, knowing who this character is, are not surprised at all to find out that he is actually a bad guy. Yeah, no. But, uh, for your for your mom and like um, some friends of mine that aren't like heavy comic nerds and didn't even know who Mysterio was when this movie came out, um, they're they're buying this. This this is what the story is, and this is just a new hero, uh, a new Doctor Strange esque hero that um, that Peter is going to fight these monsters with, and. Then boom, the rug is pulled out from under them. And I think this performance, not like the performance performance of like him pretending to be good, but Jake Gyllenhaal's performance in this scene are entirely genuine. Yeah. yeah. And like it's, I uh, it's, it's the Captain America with a cape persona. Yeah. yeah. And like I like that because it definitely feels like the character intentionally adopted traits of the Avengers into the Mysterio persona. Like, the cape brings to mind Thor aesthetically, or Doctor Strange aesthetically. He's got Cap's attitude. He's very deliberately kind of building on Peter's affection for Tony by very subtly kind of associating with him. And like, yeah, I to your point, I saw this with uh, the same friend that I saw Homecoming with for the first time, and she had no clue who Mysteria was, and she bought it hook, line, and sinker. Like, it wasn't until, like, until the reveal where she was like, really? But, like, she didn't see it coming at all. But, yeah, and, the, like, again, in keeping with problems that other people have that I don't share, but I do understand. There are people who are like, ah, can you believe Peter gives the Edith glasses to Mysterio after they hang out for like two scenes? And I'm like, no, I feel like all of the interactions that they've had have been like Mysterio effectively endearing himself to Peter. Like starting with like, yeah, and I do think it's it's two very important pieces, right? It's the part you're talking about, which is Mysterio being how he is and dealing with Peter the way he is. And the second part is Peter himself, like, not really wanting to accept the responsibility of trying to live up to Iron Man. The yeah. Man who's yeah. The universe. Yeah, when there are people who are like, 
uh, Peter gives Mysterio the glasses all willy-nilly, and that's a flaw with this movie. I'm like, no, you do understand that that's, like, deliberately supposed to be Peter's making a debatably out-of-character choice just because that's where his headspace is at. Like, he does not want this. And like yeah, Zendaya is so good. Like, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen Euphoria or not, but she's like um a really troubled, like drugged out teen in that show, and mm -hmm. she's completely different. He, like, she's an amazing actress. She has a lot of range, and like I I'd, I'd argue that this role itself gives her like some range to play with. Where and like okay, I like this because it also ties in to my reading of Brad, where it's like, he's flipping Peter off right here. You could read that as he's flipping Peter off as like, eh, screw you, I'm going to sit with MJ instead. But also as like, wow, I was listening to you talk to MJ. You just straight up lied to her face. You're a jerk, Peter. And well, like, even then, he didn't really lie so much as the omit that he was with a female in a bathroom. Well, not even a bathroom, but like behind closed doors with his pants down, like, no, I mean, uh, the like the whole uh, picking seats thing in that scene, where he's like, you you can see Brad like off to the side while uh, Peter and MJ are like, oh yeah, go ahead, pick out seats. I'll sit next to you. And then MJ sits down, and Peter immediately bails. Like if you're Brad, I can totally understand being like, dude, this is the girl that we both like, and you're just like, oh yeah, go ahead, I'm outie. It's like, too, Brad, I can understand why Peter looks like a jerk. Or maybe Peter's just going to the bathroom. Like, he doesn't know. I feel like he's entirely flipping him off because, screw you, I want her, so I'm going after her. Yeah, that's, that's right. But, uh, I, oh, yeah, to just uh, for Zendaya's performance in general, it definitely comes out more in this movie. But, again, in keeping with the theme... She, from Homecoming, is a character who, like, has all of these walls and very clearly has a persona where she's, like, the version of MJ that's, like, this totally aloof, too cool for school person. That is all a facade. Like, not to suggest that all of her interests and all of her hobbies are necessarily a facade, but, like, the attitude that she has of, like, oh, I don't care, or, like, oh, you guys are all losers... That is her, like, defense mechanism. And it'll come up later where she's like, I tell the truth, even when it hurts other people's feelings. I'm, like, overly blunt. And that, I think, is part of her, like, I don't have the best of luck getting close to people. And to be fair, that would read much, much stronger if we had any sense of her background. But going purely on what we have, I like that it's, like, Again, in a Mysterio story, all about someone lying about who they are, this is a love interest who is doing that. And when she gets the opportunity later to, like, reveal her feelings to Peter and give an honest, genuine, emotional truth, she can't do it. She's this weird paradox of a character where she, like, she will be blunt and tell the truth when it will help her distance herself from people. But when it opens herself up to people, she lies instead. Um, we talked over it, um, but I, I like that. <laughs> I like that line that um, Peter gave about um, Ultifuria when he asked him, "Hey, how's how's the suit?" And he's like, "It's so tight. tight. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, how how do you feel about this suit? Um, I prefer. You know, Spider-Man suits to have red, at least, if not red and blue. But uh, I think the suit is fine for what it is. Like, you know, it definitely feels like a Fury-issued, covert Spider-Man suit. Yeah. And, like, I, I, I wanted to keep expanding on, like, why... Like, the, the, the things that Beck constantly does to, like, endear himself to Peter and make it seem understandable that... Peter would trust him and give him the glasses. Part of that is what Peter lays out in that scene, which is like, Beck is an adult. He's a soldier. He's he's proven himself with fighting the elementals. 
but parts of it are also just that Beck seems like a really cool guy. And that starts with like the scene where he's like, never apologize for being the smartest person in the room. And then in the scene that we were talking about earlier, where he's like, my name is Mysterio. And that's a, that's a neat little bit of like, I've adopted this name that you've sort of indirectly given me. And also in this fight and like across, across both of the elemental fights, it definitely seems like Mysterio is treating Peter like an equal. And that's a nice little touch. Which, like, again, like, it's such a well thought out thing on the part of the writers and the part of the character. Like, how can he best manipulate Peter? And it's constantly in, like, every scene that they're in together. Like, yeah, you like, like, the sense you keep the citizens safe, to keep it away from the Ferris wheel, I'll deal with it. Yeah. And, like, he's not doing that as, like, a leave this to me. Like, he's doing that as a two heads are better than one. Like, one of us should be handling one thing, one of us should be handling the other, and we are, like, partners in the situation. He's not like Fury, who's, like, questioning Peter's competence and commitment. He's like, yeah, cool, I've got an assist, that's awesome. And, like, I know people who, uh, again, who don't know Mysterio, who, like, when he pulls this off, are like, oh, man, did he really die? And when he's okay, they're like, oh, nice. Like, they breathe a sigh of relief as Peter does. Again, this movie is really good about uh, getting you to empathize with Peter's emotional state and putting you in his headspace, especially relative to Mysterio. Um... The night monkey thing is so dumb, but really fun. <laughs> and see, like, this is a joke that, like, I could get if this one didn't make you laugh, but stuff like this is fine. Like, the, I might have a mint. <laughs> like, that's a nice little thing. It's, it doesn't go on too long. It's not too obnoxious. Now, see, this this whole speech that Fury's about to give, I hate it. <laughs> it, it we talked about before, I hate it because it's not really Fury telling this stuff to Peter. And so it feels really disingenuous for some alien copycat to just be regurgitating what he thinks or maybe even what Fury has told him to say. But it's not really Fury. See, I can understand that being, like, a source of, like, cognitive dissonance, where it's like, would this be more meaningful if it was actually the character we've been watching for 10 years saying this to Peter Parker? Yes. I don't hate it, though, because it still applies. Like, yeah, Talos is the one saying this, and that detracts from it, but it's not completely compromised because it remains true. Like, it is still applicable to Peter's character in this moment. This is something that he needs to hear. So the fact that the person that who he's getting it from, not being who he would like it to be, is maybe... Not even like to be who it should be. Like, who the movie is in that moment pretending that it is. Sure. But at the same time, like, I don't dislike Talos as a character, and it doesn't seem out of character for him to say something like that. Like, Talos is a bit of a goof, but he, no, it's a problem. No, my, I don't have a problem. My problem is, it, with, is with it being Talos, period. The fact that we even did this at all. Yeah, see, I don't think that. Again, um, because this is a movie where everyone... It's not, it's, not a, it's not a big deal, but I do want to talk about this because I've heard, I've heard this criticism from Cap and Danny talking about this movie. Um, he's not an idiot for... Like having his costume off in this scene and in this costume because a, not everyone in the world saw him fighting that monster and two, look at the suit. It's not an actual Spider-Man suit if you remove um, the mask. The only reason that uh, Betty even thought that it was Spider-Man was because of the eyes. Plus, look at the look it's at just the a black eyes. suit. Well, I mean like, the eyes and the black symbol. There's no. It's just a kind of utilitarian black suit. 
It doesn't like plus look at the lighting in this scene. It hardly even looks like if you're just a guy sitting in this bar and your eyes happen to come across Peter Parker in that suit, you don't I would assume he's either cosplaying or maybe he's part of some like not even, not even that. It's all black. I would I wouldn't yeah, even it's all black. I wouldn't even assume that it's anything special. I would just assume that it's an all black outfit. Like you've got to really be paying attention to how that looks to even think that it's not just something that someone would wear. I don't like, know if I agree with that. Like it's clearly a suit. Like yeah, it's a it's, we it's know kind of that. utilitarian, but it's like it could be like a like maybe riot gear, not riot gear, but um like some kind of utilitarian, like maybe spy suit or Yeah, you and I know like that military suit. You and I know that because we've been looking at it and we're paying attention. If you're just sitting in this bar and you're you like glance over, I don't think you give this kid a second glance in that outfit. Maybe. But yeah, like the point still stands that like he, no one would immediately think Spider Man, like at all. Like this doesn't compromise his identity. Hmm. So like people who complain about that are just I think looking for criticism where there is none. Or at least okay. looking for an issue where there is none. Also, something that I never noticed, and you might have also seen this uh, post on Facebook, but uh, which I really like, and you can tell that this was intentional because this room is a fabrication. Like this whole setting is fake, and if you look in the background, there's like war hero medals right next to Beck's face. There are arrows pointing at Beck, where it's like. Again, the degree to which they thought about this character being like, how is the best way to manipulate this guy? He's subtly using the visuals of this bar to get Peter to be like, yeah, you know what? This guy's the right choice. And again, the the, the, the like the, the genuineness that he puts into like at first not wanting the glasses and like saying, oh, Peter, these are yours. Stark gave them to you. And it's like, ah, up until the very last second, like, Peter and the audience totally buys that this guy is the real deal. Yeah, see, like, these plaques and stuff that are disappearing, like, that's such a neat little thing. It's like the plaques behind Mysterio are there for Peter to be, like, subtly influencing his perception of this guy. And immediately, immediately the switch is flipped. Yeah. Like it's it's a it's a great reveal for um like people in the audience that just don't know. Um and even for like people like me and you, it's still immensely satisfying. Yeah. And like I know that some people have a problem with this, just how much of an exposition dump this is. Well, well, I remember um, the first time we did this commentary, I believe you had a problem with this. Maybe not this scene itself, but um, the fact that um, Mysterio is another, essentially another Iron Man villain. Uh, I don't actually have that problem. That might have been me as I've been doing this. That was definitely you a month ago. I don't know, but I, you, you have a better memory than me. But like... Thinking about it now, I, just, I don't have a problem with it. I didn't have a problem with it in the theater. But that I, I, I swear that that's probably I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that that was me like I've been doing voicing complaints for other people that I totally understand, but I don't necessarily share. Where it's like, is it is it a little bit iffy that it's like we've had two Spider-Man villains so far and they are both like their origin, quote unquote, is tied to Tony Stark in some way. Yeah, sure. And if you're like someone who prefers, this is great. I, mean, I love they brought box yes. scraps guy back. Box scraps guy <laughs> with box scraps. <laughs> yeah, but like I know some people who are just like, I don't like how much of an exposition dump it is. I'm like, I'm I'm sorry, man. Movies have to have exposition. Like, how else would you disseminate this necessary information in this movie? And, like, uh, the part of why I love it is, like, it's it's a great... An exposition dump 
is such a good excuse to have this character just get up on a stage basically and showboat. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it, it's an entertaining, like th this is being delivered as entertaining, as interesting as it can be. Like it's not, you know, the Matrix Reloaded where we just are like standing, one guy standing, another guy sitting in a chair. Yeah. And we're just looking at that guy just divulge all this tedious information. And like entertainment uh, on side, it's necessary for this character because yeah. we just got the reveal if we don't have this, then we spend a lot of scenes going, okay, Mysterio's a bad guy. But why? Who's but not why just, and how and not just why and how, but who is the real guy? If the guy that yeah. we've been watching so far is a is a facade, then what is his real character like? And this shows you he's like a really hammy, over the top, like showboating, kind of unstable, frenzied, manic guy. And like having him stand up and deliver like pages of exposition, like tells you this is the real Quentin Beck. This is who this guy is. And like, I love his line about like, uh, uh, about a, uh, a fake guy from another dimension named Quentin, which is totally ridiculous and apparently exactly what people are willing to believe right now. Because in keeping Seriously? with Seriously? Everyone believed it? Yes, it's great. One, because it gives us the subtle implication that his real name is not even Quentin. So, like, even after this reveal, you could argue there are still things about this character that are fake throughout the whole movie that we do not know to be sh to be true. And so even up until the point that he dies, the audience and Peter are, like, left in the dark about parts of this guy and he's still got illusions up. But also, I like the sense of escalation where... Speaking of Iron Man, that builds on the Iron Man 3 thing that I love so much, where Aldrich Killian is like, after the guy with the big hammer came down, subtlety kind of had its day. So I didn't just need a terrorist, I needed a super terrorist. And so now we're at this place where like, we are at a point in this universe after all this stuff has happened. If you want people to pay attention to you, you have to be a superhero. You've got to go around and fly around and have lasers and people will just believe whatever nonsense you make up for a backstory. No question. That is the extent to which this universe has become more and more heightened with time. Yeah, that's where we're at right now. And like again, Zendaya is just ah, she's really great at playing like this really sort of genuine emotion because her walls come down when she's around Peter whether she wants them to or not and like very soon she will put them back up and i i'd argue like kind of fail to do so but we'll talk about that at the time but like it's it's a really interesting thing where i part of their chemistry and part of what makes the relationship work so much especially relative to the theme of truth is that like she cannot help but be her actual self -reliant. And as as rough as it is for these to be movies and, and instead of instead of shows, um, I really do hope that we get to spend um, more time exploring them together in the next movie. Even though he's gonna have to deal with the whole world, um, you know, being down his throat because they uh, they know his identity. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm confident that they can do it, and I really hope that they do it because. It would be such a shame to... I also don't want us to do the thing of, like, we put them together that we have to throw job drama in their relationship immediately. Yeah, no. Like, you can have drama in the sense that, like, dramatic things happen around them and they have to react to that, but relationship drama in the sense of, like, oh, man, let's immediately... Like, well, this other girl's flirting with you, or I'm jealous, or insecure. Like, like, anything to immediately jeopardize the relationship and have it be like, oh, man, are they gonna stay together? Like, no, no, we don't need that. Yeah, please don't need that. And, like, that's... We're, we're, we're at the scene where she's like, you're Spider-Man, but I also want to point out very uh, briefly her, uh, her, like, little tidbit about, um... The fact that they used to hang people on the bridge and like earlier when she was talking about the Eiffel Tower stuff, that's part of what I mean. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> that's one of my favorite jokes in the whole movie. 
The news never, never lies. lies. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, nah, it's just like, and again, I, I like that line because, again, it fits into the whole lies motif of the movie. But, um, yeah, she keeps giving him these, like, weird, morose, somber, like, odd tidbits about stuff. But unlike when she's interacting with other people or in Homecoming, where it seems like she's doing those things to distance herself from people, she's, like, trying to connect with him. And, like, here, where it's like, it's now, now she's being faced with, like, the actual opportunity to be close to him emotionally. And her gut instinct is like, no, I'd, I'd, yeah, she's like, she's putting up walls and putting up illusions. And what and I like, like about that is it's very much in line with traditional MJ. Yeah. Like, like this is a very unique take on MJ, but I'm, I'm now in a place now that we have this movie where I can say, even though she is, you know, Michelle Johnson and not Mary Jane. Mm hmm. It's still MJ. It's just a very unique and different take on MJ. Yeah, and again, and like on the long list of problems that other people have that I don't share, but I get, it's like they think it's too far of a deviation. Yeah, it's, like, it's too like it's so far in the other direction that, well, not other direction, but it's so so much. It's so different. It should just be its own thing. And again, part of it is the lack of backstory. If we knew what her yeah. own life was like, I feel like way less people would have that problem because that's the big thing that underlies the, for traditional MJ, that underlies the, like, the party girl persona or the, like, popular girl persona. Here, she is still MJ in the fact that she is putting up a persona. The persona is the opposite extreme where rather than being overly, so uh, overly social, she's a loner. But if the root of the persona is the same, then I think less people have a problem with it. We just don't have a clear enough look at what the root is. Um, oh, I'm not too sure about that. Like her being the the bombshell party girl that every, everybody likes, like that's that's what everyone thinks of when they think MJ. Right, but I mean, like in terms of. Like what we're talking about, like the actual core of the character, in yeah. both cases, it's her leaning into that when she's she's like playing up a persona, and she's like covering up for like insecurities or issues, and like she is clearly covering up for insecurities here. But unlike a lot of the other takes on MJ, we don't quite know where those are coming from yet. She says she has. This Okay. I was just going to, she, she says she has trouble getting close to people. We should at some point know Why where that, that started. Yeah. yeah. But yes, this scene is great. This, uh, it's so good. And like, he's playing it like a, like a manic film director. The, the motion suit is a nice touch. The motion capture suit. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And so we haven't touched on this at all, but like now that it's part of the movie, like Quentin, De yeah, Quentin basically is a director, and this movie now, on top of everything else, becomes kind of a subtle commentary on the movie industry. And like, like this stuff right here, where it's like more, more, uh, more damage, more casualties, more coverage. Like, all of this destruction, it's worth it for the bottom line. Like, that's a thing yeah. that people have been complaining about with superhero movies. Do we constantly have to have the the destruction and the collateral damage and the scale always be so big? It's like, yeah, we need the scale to be big. That's how I'm going to get all the eyes on me. Um, interestingly, like, he made the illusion tech. Um, and I assume these drones are just... Like, because of the same, the exact same drone that Edith has, like, he essentially just gets a bigger supply of drones so he can make the big event. But um, I'm assuming that the drones themselves are just drones that he was somehow able to steal from Tony. Because he doesn't talk about the drones as something he made. It's simply the illusion. Yeah, I think we're left, like, like, 
that's one of those things where I don't think that that's in any way intentional. It's what we're left to assume. Like, we just yeah. have to assume that you're correct. I think what it is is who knows, maybe he or William or whoever did make those drones, but we're going to have a butt ton of drones in one scene, and it might have been tedious for, like, the effects artist to be like, all right, here how Beck's drones looks, and here how the Stark drones looks, and we got to make them look slightly different, but also similar, and, like, I think that's, like, uh, an, an assumption that we have to make born out of just, like, practical behind-the-scenes choices of just, like, is it worth it to make the drones look different from each other? Like, who I'm not can... saying that they even need to look different. Um, yeah, I'm me just saying, uh, I'm just saying. Like, I think the... it makes more sense if Beck just made the tech as opposed to those drones that he has. It makes more sense if he just stole that. If he just stole like the the few drones he has from um, from Stark. Yeah. I agree. I'm just saying I think we're left to draw that conclusion for reasons that nobody making the movie was actually thinking about. And see, I like this. Like, uh, uh, she, earlier in the scene, when it's just her and Peter, she's still being genuine, where she is, like, completely thrown off by all this stuff. She's like, you had access to killer drones? You almost killed Brad? And like when Peter starts undressing, like that whole stretch is her being genuine. And like she has her guards down. And then she spots Ned and she's back to aloof, too cool for school. Oh, yeah, I totally figured it out all by myself, even though I was only like 67% sure, she said. And it's like as soon as someone else is in the room, she is back to putting up the walls. Yeah, like she's she's really good at like switching that like part of that character on and off. Um, all black suits, um, I feel rarely look good in in the daytime. Like there's Snake Eyes' suit and there's this suit. Are you saying this suit is an example of one that does or doesn't? Does yeah, okay. like Snake Eyes. Mm. <laughs> what? Uh, no, I'm just thinking about the nightmaker thing. But um, this car that 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 that, that bit where uh, Fury pulls up in the car. Apparently, the car is entirely CG. And like, that blew people's minds, and they were like, "Why?" But I'm just kind of impressed with it, honestly. <laughs> this is funny. And again, I do like the, the, the super strength dance. Yeah. It's always helpful to like get those little reminders of like, oh yeah, he's if he actually like puts effort into like doing something like physical, he could he could like accidentally like break anything. But uh and this this scene finally brings to mind a motif that uh a friend of mine picked up on in which I've sort of like I, I I like it. I like it as an observation, and I think it ties into the stereo and all that stuff. Is like in tying with all the illusions, the illusions and the fakery and the pretending in this movie is often associated with glass and reflections. So like obviously Mysterio, that whole persona is a lie, and he's got a big glass helmet for a head. This room that we will later find out is a complete fabrication. This building is full of glass, full of reflections. These characters are reflected all over the place. In this illusion sequence, there's going to be a bit that emphasizes, like, Peter stuck in glass or, like, looking at his glass reflection. The necklace he gets MJ is made of glass, and when that breaks is when they, like, really come together. I think it's a nice little visual symbolism motif throughout the movie is like glass and reflections as as symbolic of the lies that these characters are telling. I think it's uh it's really smart. Like it's if you actually start thinking about it, it's a little odd that Mysterio would care to like 
hologram his original suit onto him for the sequence. But um, it is a smart way to get more of his suit into the movie. Mm -hmm. And this bit with uh, I, I love that transition from the moon to him grabbing her. That's really cool. Yeah, the fact that his head becomes the moon. That's great. Or the, the moon becomes his head, I mean. And this bit right here, the giant oh. stereo hand punching him ripped straight from the comics. Yeah, like a couple of these shots are like just straight up comic panels or covers. It's beautiful. This whole sequence is, it feels like a comic book come to life. So yeah. Like again, glass is all over the place here. <laughs> ah, and I love that. And like people have a problem with this, um, sequence looking overly cg but i really like it because then when when stuff like this happens and he is like out of the sequence and back in reality it becomes really jarring and it's another thing that puts you in peter's headspace we're like now we're back in cg land reality is practical like location land well, and like switching it's... between those two things like is it, it it's off-putting it's weird um, I don't necessarily have that. I mean, I, I guess that's an impression you can, you can gleam off of it, but um, I really, like, especially when the CG is well done like this, I really roll my eyes when I hear people complain about that, especially because um, if you actually want to think about it in terms of the actual scene, like how these are these, this, it is CG in the context of the film. Exactly. Like, not only that, but how, how else would you do this? How well, yeah, there is no other way to do this. But yeah, I just like it for the- Like the statues you could do with miniatures, but that's about it. And like there was concept art that uh, went around for uh, a couple of different ways that like the uh, the Tony zombie could have been done. And like, like there were a bunch of them or like they were like giant, I think, I don't know. But like the transition between the spider eyes to like the Legion of Mysterios, and then he's stuck in the helmet, and like the helmet is a snow globe. Like this stuff this is, shot is a cover. It's a cover. Yeah. Cover, yeah. Like this is all perfect, 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 perfect. This is really smart too. This is one of um my, my favorite bits of uh I guess trickery in the movie. Mm-hmm. Like that, he he holograms um, all these people and Nick Fury in the in the real environment and tricks Peter. Yeah. And like you can tell that he gamed this whole thing out to where like. Obviously, he's not just gonna straight up tell Fury, or he would be very hesitant to. And so you can tell, like, far in advance, Beck was like, all right, what I gotta do is frazzle him. I gotta really throw him off his game, and then I'll pretend to be Fury again, and then he'll just tell me. So, like, really, the whole point of that sequence was just to get Peter and, like, uh, enough of a headspace that, like, he'll just tell Fury whatever he wants to hear, just to be like, all right, I, I just want this to be done. Also, him getting hit by that train, major oof. Which was um, a little too much for some people I know. Really? I haven't heard that. Too much. That he just gets hit by a bullet. He just gets hit by a speeding bullet train and like that like spider-man can take a lot of punishment um but i do know some people like even knowing that that felt like that was going to stretch too far that he gets hit by that train and he's not in a way worse shape than he is but i mean uh, he's knocked out long uh, taken to a completely different like country like so, a lot of people feel like you should have had, um, at the very least, like maybe a brace for his arm or something. Like people, I'm, I know a few people that feel like he gets off too easy there, getting hit by a full-on bullet train. Eh, I don't know. I don't it's know. not my complaint. I'm just, I'm just saying. 
Yeah, I that I that's a new one for me. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> this whole scene is funny though. Yeah. Yeah, this is subtle stuff like this is nice, like the power centers breaking out. <laughs> he's like, okay, he's just wearing my mask. I'm gonna keep going. Yeah, he's like, I do not have time for this. Yeah. And that just closes the gate back. And immediately he steps on poop. Because yeah, that of classic Parker lot. Yeah. <laughs> um I I'm I'm really excited um to get this next scene with Happy. It is it might be what it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, nice. And I'm not gonna like ha it's interesting because when you go back to Homecoming, like Happy certainly wasn't a non-entity, but he was not as as involved as uh, he was the middleman. Yeah, he was the middleman. And to see him like the prominence here in a more like neutral, like intimate role with Peter, like well, intimate role with Peter, I should say, um, was really nice. Yeah, and this like, was really nice. Like all the all the flowers are CG, but um, because like obviously like, you wouldn't want to like destroy an actual flower garden. This but movie. it looks great. Yeah, like a lot of people don't even know that. I wouldn't have been able to tell if it hadn't been pointed out for me, but. Uh, but yeah, like I, I do like that. Um, even though it's debatably not actually all that much more screen time, Happy does have a closer role to Peter in this movie, and it does feel like it's building off of Homecoming, where they have a little bit of a small, subtle arc in Homecoming of the two of them kind of reaching a synthesis, where like Happy at first wants absolutely nothing to do with this kid, and then you realize that they're in some ways maybe a little bit similar and that they can get along and that he's like, see, I told you he was a good kid. And so when and we it, get here, it feels like it is, you know, built on something. And it's nice to see Favreau be able to have such a major role here when he kicked off this whole franchise with the first Iron Man film. And now here he is with the last film of uh, the Infinity Saga having a scene with Spider-Man. Yeah. And, and, like, and the first version of Spider-Man being so influenced by his uh, his initial Iron Man. Yeah, and having him be such a part of the uh, the real quote unquote real end of the Infinity Saga. And see, now this is the scene that everyone is like when when we get to. The him blasting ACDC and they're like, see, it's just them. Well, wait, but, but before before you even get to that, before you even get to that, I love what he says here. Yeah, You're this is right. like in like they were best friends, and um, it's like, yeah, now Tony was was a mess, and he was he was scattered, but he was definitely not this perfect person. Yeah, that everyone has in their head. And like that's why I brought up the ACDC thing because everyone who dislikes it is like. That's contradicting what he just said because uh, Peter is Iron Man, but I'm like, it's it's more it's more layered than that interpretation is giving it credit because when Happy says you're not Iron Man, you're never gonna be Iron Man. He doesn't mean you're not like Tony. He's saying you're, you're not, not gonna live up to that ideal that he's now set, having died to save the entire universe. Yeah, because Tony himself couldn't even do that. No. Iron Man is an idea. Tony is a guy. Peter doesn't have to live up to the idea. He has to live up to the guy. And that means it's okay for him. He can be flawed. Like and and and, and that ties back to him giving the glasses to Mysterio in the first place, which is the root of this whole problem. He's like, I'm not perfect enough. I'm too flawed to be the hero that everyone needs me to be. And the lesson that he needs to learn isn't you don't have to be like Tony and it's not you have to be more like Tony. It's it's okay to be you and be flawed and still be the hero. You can be both. You don't have to and, pressure yourself into 
into like erasing like your flaws and your mistakes just to be Spider-Man. We talked over the exchange I had a little earlier, but um, what are we gonna do? He's like, I'm gonna kick his ass. He's like, no, what are we gonna do like right now? Because <laughs> we've been he's hovering floating over this field for the past twenty minutes. <laughs> Um, yeah, and this is that scene that mirrors like Tony doing the whole hologram thing in his first movie, and it's like we're not saying he's Tony with this, but the influence is there, and that's okay. Yeah, especially since he doesn't even recognize the band. Yeah, he doesn't like, even know what song this is. Like a lot of people dismiss that because it's a joke, but I think it's important the fact that that yeah. song comes on and and he, he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't have Tony's relationship with it. He's not the same person. No. And so I think this scene actually does, like, it, it, it firmly takes him out of Iron Man's shadow, but reminds the audience, yeah, yeah like, he, this is a Spider-Man that, like, had Tony as a role model, and that that's fine. He's still his own person. He's still his own hero. Yeah. <gasps> And again, this scene, again, ties into the truth angle, where it's like, what even is truth? And like, let's, let's, let's talk about your truth, Brad. Why, why, why are you snooping on people in the bathroom? And it's like, again. Yeah, like, the, the, the theme of truth, and like, that is a really, actually an interesting topic to tackle in a movie with Mysterio, and he's the main villain, and he even says, and that hologram secrets on the truth, Mysterio is the truth. Yeah. It's like, who can tell what the truth even is? Um, and until Spider-Man shows up to stop him, that narrative he's writing with um, that big elemental in it, you know, just wrecking the the uh, tower, you know, the, the bridge, that, that is going to be the truth unless Spider-Man stops it. Yeah, it's what the audience watching the movie accepted as truth. And like, speaking of narrative, I like that that that's what's going on in this scene. Like again, I like the 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 bits of comedy that work best in this movie because a lot of it does still land for me. But the ones that work best are the ones that do kind of have that thematic tie to it. Where is it funny that MJ just like totally got everyone thinking that Brad is a perv? Yes, but also. It's her controlling a narrative and kind of, in a way, pulling a Mysterio to, like, draw attention away from Peter by being like, well, look, everybody, this is what's actually happening. Let me dictate the truth to you. And, like, the news never lies. Even that, for as little throwaway gag as it is, is still tying in. Yeah, like the fact that he doesn't talk about making these drones at all, um, it definitely makes me think that the drone he already had, he just took from Stark Industries. Yeah, we've got to again because they just they look so similar, they function basically the same. So, like, yeah, that's got to be the case. Um. There was a little deleted scene where he's in a uh, like an underground parking garage talking about the plan a little more before he executes it. Yeah, it was pretty short. <laughs> that one. I don't think we lost anything with that scene. No, but um, you know, it's just uh, there's more of Jake John Hall in the movie, which uh, <laughs> I would true, fair enough. <laughs> Maybe that was the secret sauce to uh, X Apocalypse. This at Joan Hall, that movie might have been watchable. Huh. Well, I don't know, man. Oscar Isaac is not as good as Joan Hall, but he's he's a pretty great actor, and he can salvage that one. Not with a script like that. No, he couldn't. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I can't, I can't wait to to finally see this suit again in action, like. I it's, really it's, so, it's, it's, it's so inspired and ballsy to play with um, Spider-Man's suit because a lot of people have like their what they 
they see as the classic thing, you should never deviate from it. Um, we, we did that with the PS4 game, making his spider white. Um, I know that, like, when people just got the initial um, announcement that that's what the suit would be and what it would look like, and the whole white spider and everything, people were like, oh, what the heck are you doing? And then we all saw the game and the, and the footage, and it looked great. And, you know, there's, you know, obviously story and practicality reasons for why it looks the way it does, but it looks phenomenal. Yeah. And it does distinguish it from every, every other interpretation. Character. Mm. Like, when you see that, you know that's the PS4 version. And just like, this one is so good, and I really, I, part, of, part of what I hope we do with him no longer uh, being able to uh, be in the public eye without, like, people coming after him or him being seen a certain way, I hope that we, I hope that he loses some of his resources, if only because I want him to keep this suit. I get yeah. it. it helps I don't want him to change it again. Yeah, I get but it. It helps yourself. Kind of started that trailer. We do that with Iron Man. We do that with Captain America and Widow. Like, we don't need to change the suit every movie. Yeah, and like to be fair, the cap suit does keep changing between um, Age of Ultron and Endgame, but it's fairly consistent visually between from Age of Ultron to Endgame, where it becomes a different thing. It's mostly like the Age of Ultron suit being slightly modified or like slightly built on. And like the Widow suits are all noticeably different, but it's like in little ways. And for Iron Man, it just makes sense. It's in character for him to have a bunch of visually different suits. For Spider Man, I get it. I'm fine with him not having multiple suits for the most part, but I'd like to have a movie where he's just in a suit. Yeah, I hope that, and I hope they stick with this because he only wears his suit in the third act, and they sold the movie on this suit. Yeah, I um, I mentioned earlier, my least favorite bits of comedy are all the uh the the teacher stuff. Yeah, there, there's apparently a bit here that got cut where um, it was still played for comedy, but it was like Mr. Harrington basically being like, "This is my fault. I must be cursed. Like, take me, leave the kids." And I'm like, even if that's a joke, I would have kept that because it does the one thing that, like, is a big issue for me with his character, which is that in Homecoming, we have we have him be like, I couldn't lose another kid on a school trip. Not again. So clearly, this is a guy who has gone on a school trip where a kid has died. And then guess what? In Infinity War, they're on a school trip when half of his class presumably dies again. I would have liked to have something building on that in this movie, where it's like, this is too much. I can't keep having like dangerous things happen to me and my kids on a trip. And like, even if it is still played for a joke, having him basically be like, I must be cursed. Something must be wrong with me. Just leave the kids out of it. That would have been a nice little thing to like build on that moment. But yeah. Uh, another thing I want to talk about in regards to this suit, Ouch. I like that um, for the most part it doesn't really have any like, major gadgetry. Like it doesn't have Karen in it, um, hardly now. Um, yeah, no. Uh, like, yeah, it, it doesn't have Karen. It doesn't have the you know the spider drone, spider bot. Like he just has. He's back to base. He's just with his legs. And, and like, there, like that, but I think that, that's fine. There was that weird promotional thing that they did that was like highlighting how much the suit costs and like people didn't like that because again they prefer peter being a middle class guy and like he's got a suit that's literally worth millions if not billions of dollars and i'm like okay i understand having a problem with that but functionally like so long as that doesn't impact the way that it functions and it's just like you know so he he can do he, the, he made the suit with his resources but he didn't make another Iron Man suit masquerading as a Spider-Man suit. Yeah, no. Like, he does the taser thing where he presses the thing and he can, like, but electrify. that's fine because it just enhances what, it, what he already has. Like, the yeah. electric webs are fine. Yeah, like, electric webbing is about as high-tech as I would prefer that he gets. But other than that, he's really just using his own, like, ingenuity and skill, like... Yeah. Like, uh, this he doesn't really have any other gadgets. 
this whole sequence is him like thinking on the fly, making use of his strength, his agility, his webs, and that's pretty much it. This is a gorgeous scene. Yeah. And like the sh like this shot, yeah, of him like on the drone as the illusion comes down around him, that's great. And we talked over it, but um him getting fed lines by Guterman, like like uh standing there reading a script is great. Um, another thing about this suit, they didn't just like reskin the homecoming suit. Like if you look closely at the mask, they tweak the mask. Um I like the the, the design of the the mask a lot more. Um, like this is a different suit. It's not just reskinned with the blue replaced with black. Yeah, no. Yeah, I still need the cave jokes. Yep, and uh, I'm wondering what Mysterio's um plan is because he's he says they're under my illusion suit the Mysterio suit. Um but then we don't really like we don't see him actually do that because Happy shows up and he's focused on Happy and then he's focused on um killing the Peter's other friends, classmates. So um I'm wondering what the what the deal was because he just dropped the illusion in front of everyone. Yeah and, see uh, I'm I'm still because I can see why you would think that this is wrong and it might just straight up be wrong because like the way I'm not even saying wrong, I'm just saying I'm No no no, I mean what I'm what I'm about to suggest because of like the fact that he's not visibly damaged at all yet and like is it a continuity thing? Like I don't know. I still get the impression that even if like it doesn't end up like making like he's, sense. He's planning out to to like set up Spider Man as this is all going on when he doesn't even know if he's going to lose yet. Yeah, because he says he has contingencies, and I think that has to be what the contingency is. That's definitely the contingency. I think but, when he's um, like, I think when he's like, drop the illusion. We're not doing the giant monster thing anymore. He at least has like Plan B or C or D in the back of his head. Like, all right, however this works out, I'm going to make sure that this kid goes down. Let me set him up. I think even but if he's I, not acting on it yet, I think he has that idea starting now. Probably, yeah. Now that he knows he's alive. And then he's already back and trying to stop him. I like this. I like that uh, MJ is proactive and brave enough to actually just like grab, freaking, grab a freaking mace and hit the drone with it. Yeah. And we did have MJ do this before, um, and it was fun. It was uh, funnier because in Spider Man Two, like she tries to get the drop on Doc Ock, and he just knocks her away. Yeah, yeah. it's like it's just it's a nice it's a nice little thing, and it even applies to Betty and Ned because they tip over the uh, the thing, and it's like that's a genuinely clever move that not everyone would have thought of to do to like distract the thing just long enough for MJ to hit it. And it's like, okay, fine. Like, these are not the deepest, most complex characters. But if you can take, like, five to ten seconds of screen time to show them do something smart or clever or brave. I dig that move with the car. The car move is so... This whole thing. This whole thing I love so much. Like, the car is great. And the way that he, like, swings around underneath him, like, when he's about to get to... Just this whole sequence. I feel like this, like self-contained sequence, is the One best, best Spider-Man in the Spider-Man movie. The best Spider-Man action, at least in a live-action movie, since the train fight, probably. And that's not to like poo-poo on the action in the other movies, because there is some great stuff in both of the amazing films, and there's some great stuff in Spider-Man Three. But I just I really like this a lot. And, like, again, I like how this is true of all of the Spider-Men, but I think, to a degree, it becomes especially true, like, visually with this one. You can tell how much he's improvising. Yeah. Like, in most of his action scenes, if not all of them, you constantly get the sense that, like, 
this isn't necessarily yeah this isn't necessarily a peter that like has a plan he'll like he's he's got to think on his toes constantly because he's just getting hit on all sides by stuff and that's spider-man in general yeah um, in spectacular he does that a lot which i feel like we should do a video uh review or commentate i was thinking review like i was yeah. just talk about maybe one whole season and then the other whole season oh yeah i'm down for that give me an excuse to rewatch that show which i don't necessarily need an excuse to do but why not and i still think of that as the best adaptation that we've had so far character agreed uh, and I still think of, like, when I, when I go back and read Ultimate, or really any Spider-Man book where he's a teenager, um, Josh Keaton's voice is still in my head as I read through dialogue. Hmm. And this whole, like, sharing out sequence is a little odd, because I think <laughs> half of it is really interesting, because this is where MJ... MJ's was... bit is really interesting. MJ's the rest bit... of kind of whatever. MJ's bit is really interesting. Flash is not really interesting, but it is like something because it's like he is acknowledging that his videos are stupid that's like underlining again this guy has some kind of insecurity and again like with mj the thing that we like the the attitude that we see him have constantly is a front and on that level it's it's interesting to know that about flash like the the obnoxious guy who's like oh i'm so awesome that's not really who he is but with Ned and Betty's and, like, I'm in love with Spider-Man's aunt, there's not really anything to those three. So uh, we, we, I want to I wanna hit the uh, the point that I hit in the other commentary that I want to make sure I hit we talked over it. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man finally running out of webbing. Yes. I yeah. freaking love that. Yeah. First time we've done it in Spider-Man movie. And not like he runs out of natural webbing because he's got power and continence. Or like his web shooter gets broken. No, he just used it all up. Yeah, that's fun. That's something Stanley did almost to an annoying degree in his and, original run. And it um, creates this extra element of tension to this last bit because it's like, okay. He has to rely on just his ingenuity. Yeah, and, and like we've seen him throughout all of these movies, like even not in this continuity, rely so much on webbing and action scenes now he's got to go up against a whole bunch of killer drones with none of it. And this, ah, uh, this looks so cool. Yes, it does. It's just so rad. Also, not to oh, jinx I love, it. I love Dylan Hall's delivery here. Yes. But throughout this whole scene, oh, now! Fire all the drones now! <laughs> like he's... And that is his undoing. Yeah. He gets shot right there. And like again, it's it's sort of building the the way that like little lines that don't necessarily get like expanded on end up being relevant in just the way that they play out and are shown is great. Like MJ's like, I have trouble getting close to people. I tell the truth, even though it hurts people's feelings. And like we don't uh, keep talking about that. Nick, we just oh. Nick. Yeah. Uh, um this this bit right here. Um, I like that uh, we have this this loud little beat where he, he tries to kill Peter. You this is see, a really cool moment. You can see his arm is getting in the position like he's holding the gun. This is I so love weird. the fear in Peter's eyes. Like he was able to stop it, but he was inches away from getting shot. And again, you can't trick him anymore while he is framed by shattered glass. But yeah, like yeah, the, gla uh, the glass motif is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But like with the MJ thing, it's a little line where Quentin is like, "Oh, Tony fired me for being unstable," and then it's like we don't keep having characters call him unstable. We don't have him like call back to that like, "Oh, he's unstable." No, that line's just, really funny. Like if you play those kind of games, it's like, "Can you can you hand me the the spears?" Like that's a hell of a like. <laughs> <laughs> very specific. That's just really but, funny to me. But yeah, it's like it's his unstableness that gets him shot. It's like his 
his lack of self-control is just a character trait that's allowed to be shown rather than told constantly. I like that we uh, that we give ourselves the option to either bring him back or have him die. Yeah, because, him. because Pierre can't bring himself to say, is he dead? He says, is this real? And that's interesting for Peter because it's like, you can see on his face in this scene and when he's talking to MJ about it, where he's like, did you stop Mysterio? And you can see him think for a second, like, yeah, I stopped him. He's kind of dead and it's kind of my fault. Yeah. Yeah, where it's like, Peter killed a whole bunch of aliens, like nondescript, sentientless aliens in uh, Endgame. But it's like, this is the first person Peter's actually kind of killed. And we don't talk about it, but you can see it on his face, the way that that's affected him. Yeah, which is why I, I do think it works. Like, it's smart. Like, Peter, like, thinking about it, like, you're right. Like, he wouldn't say, is he dead? Because he doesn't even want to think about that. Yeah, no. Like, if he says it, it becomes real. Yeah. Um, this is really dumb, though. Like, this is the scene where he has his mask off in the middle of the bridge. And anyone with a camera, like, can easily just zoom in. Like, oh, Peter, like, Mysterio doesn't even need to set him up. He's doing all his work for him. And again, like, I get it. You want his face to be visible for this scene because it's emotional. And like, like we said, with the whole, like, internalizing Mysterio's death and talking to MJ, like, yeah, his face should be visible. But easy fix. have MJ come up to the tower? Don't have them be on the bridge. Have them be somewhere else. Why are they? Why did you choose to set this scene here? Is it just because the bridge could have swung, maybe picked her up and then swung her to a secluded like building? Or again, just have her have her run there. Like it's not. It can't be that far away. Or like. If it's have him like meet halfway so that it's still on ground level, but it's not out in the open. Yeah. This is so dumb. Yeah. But again, glass necklace is broken, and now the two of them are just completely done pretending with each other. Yeah, just is it just because a bridge is like a romantic, dramatic setting, even when everything is on fire? I guess so. I don't know, man. Like, yeah. such an easy fix. Yeah, and all the drones are like gone. Like, no one's coming back to this area. To Although, time. to be like, fair, police. Like, yeah, like police. Police would be the real problem, right? Because like civilians and like no civilians would, would probably be evacuated. And now that I think about it, I do see flashing lights on the corner of the bridge. I, I just saw it in the shot in the background. That was weird. So, yeah, they're clearly there. Yeah. But it's like, so why aren't they scoping out the bridge? They, they would have seen him. The answer is they didn't think about it. Yeah, they didn't, they're not thinking that hard about it. And, and I mean, I feel like you shouldn't have to think that hard about it. They're in the middle of a bridge. He yeah. has his mask off. Yeah, it's so weird. And uh, and every other time we've done that in a Spider-Man movie, like we're at least thinking about it. Like when we do it in the Andrew Garfield film, it's like, on the top of the bridge. Else. Yeah, it's under the bridge. No one else is around. It's the middle of the night. Like, or in the second one, it's like the opposite. He's at the top of the bridge, And he's he's far enough he's far enough away and high up that no one would see him unless they had a freaking uh, set of binoculars. Okay, I, I forgot to mention this, but like, I I also the other reason that I think the glasses should have been destroyed is in keeping with the glass motif, because Peter's literally like he's part of his problem. The big MacGuffin of the movie is a literal pair of glasses that represents, like, expectations and, like, Mysterio's lies and all this stuff, even just See, the matter. Thing. I don't know if I agree with you on that, because while it is questionable for Tony to make that after Ultron, it is decisively not Ultron. It is not True. a central force that 
can think for its own and become essentially Skynet. Like, even even that is what has to control it. us. It's just a matter of who. It's no different from the right person pulling Thor's hammer or, you know, a good person being an Iron Man suit like Rhodey. True. Like, it's all about who controls it versus, like, what it is in, in, on principle. Like, True. I don't feel like he needs to destroy those drones on principle. I, I'm not really with you on that. That's fine. But even then... There's also just, I think, on a visual symbolic level, it would have been meaningful to have those things break. Like, not even get rid of the drones. Well, it, it would kind of mirror Iron Man 3 really well when he destroys all of the suits there. Yeah, but like, I wouldn't even necessarily need the drones themselves to all be destroyed. Like, they can be up in space or whatever, but it would have been cool if the glasses themselves were destroyed. There's got to be other ways to access those things. And also, now we're in a status quo where Peter has access to those drones. Like, if for no other reason, get rid of the glasses so that he can't just use them whenever he wants anymore. Like, even if that's oh. not destroying them, have him put them away somewhere. Have him, like, lock them I up. I love this. Like, this is yeah. one of, now, one of my, my favorite swinging scenes. And, like, they're always good. Um, but I like modernizing it. Don't, don't text in. Don't text and swing. I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I really like this. And again, like we mentioned earlier, it feels like he's improvising. Like there's we talked over the ant well, you talked over the ant main scene, but yeah, yeah you, I hate it all that for us you, to you really like, do all this build up with her and Happy and like she she cares about like Happy having a relationship with with uh with Peter, but it's no more serious than a summer fling. Like it just makes it makes Aunt May feel really mature, and it just it just plays this weird scenes that didn't really need to be in the movie because they don't lead to anything. I don't quite I don't quite that into it. I dislike it just because I I feel like it's a waste of Aunt May in this movie to have that be like her thing. Yeah, but like the idea that it's a problem for her to call it that or that. Like that somehow contradicts with her and like with her wanting Happy and Peter to get along. It's like it could just be that she likes Happy and she wants Peter to like she wants them to have a good relationship regardless of like if they're dating or not. Like I, that that doesn't. But if they're not, why would she? Why would she even care that much if it's not serious? I don't think she cares that much. Like she doesn't seem like she's forcing it or anything. Like he calls. Well, that's Happy. the thing. Is it just. It doesn't need. It just doesn't need to be there. Like it's just. Yeah, I agree with that. But I just, I'm not reading into it what you're reading into it, and that it makes her look immature. But yeah, like, and also, just so that no one doesn't, just so that it's aware that we mentioned it, the Uncle Ben, uh, luggage blowing up, and they both laugh about it. That's a, that's a, that's an oof. That's yeah, I, I don't like that. And again, Aunt May is my big sore spot with this movie, and I hate pretty much everything that's done with her. Bring my her mistake. on the trip. Why would they not do that? You wouldn't even have to, like, change the runtime that much. Just give her um, that. Well, if... I imagine if they put her on that trip, they suddenly now have to find a reason to put Happy on it as well. Um, I don't think so. Because, like, well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're seeing Given the movie as it ended up being, yeah, you don't even need Happy to have any scenes together at all, given that none of that really amounts to anything. And even if but, it did, like, so they're seeing each other. Happy's still got other stuff to do. He's, like, he's he's doing Stark industry stuff. Like, on May, Happy... Happy is the guy that his aunt is dating. Aunt May is his guardian. Like, she can come on a school trip, and Happy can be off doing his job. Okay. Um, I'm just saying, like, if you're still going to, I don't know, try to still, like, make the same movie as it as it was, but with Aunt May on the trip, like, um, involving Happy, like, he would need to either go on the trip or I don't know, but this this scene, I I love I love this cliffhanger on first viewing. 
the more I've thought about it, the more I've conflicted I've been about it. Because as I said in the last commentary, um, it's we we haven't really cracked the code, and I don't think this is a code that can be cracked. Maybe I'll be proven wrong when we finally get that third movie. But a Spider-Man with his identity outed, we don't know how to write that. Yeah. See, and you you have that reservation. If I were as confident as you that that's what we're going to be doing going forward, I would share that reservation. But for me... You like, think he's I, somehow going to find a way to make people think that he's not actually fighting? Yeah. I'm assuming going in that that's what we're doing with the third one. Is that some... Because I think they're pretty careful with the way that they're playing the Mysterio clip. Whether they've worked out what exactly the story that, is... That is true. That, that this, this isn't proof that he's Spider-Man by any means. Yeah. Whether or not they've worked out what they want to do with it this far in advance or not, like, I'm sure that movie's still in the early writing processes, if that. But, like, they're they're clearly covering their bases with what this clip actually shows. Like, his face is not visible in the video. And, yeah. like, we only have Mysterio's word to go on that he is Peter Parker. So I think it's perfectly feasible that by the end of the next movie... The conflict is going to be okay. How do I, if if Spider convince people that he's not? And yeah. Interestingly, that was an issue that um, Peter had in one of the episodes in Spectacular when Venom tries to out his identity. Yeah, and that's part of what I'm basing this off of. Is like we've done that before, where it's like, oh crap, Peter Parker's life is compromised because it's been added that he's Spider Man, but there's no hard evidence, so he can salvage this. And. Um, it and going forward, that would give us a great um, version of the status quo that some people have, where it's like, okay, Peter can prove that Peter and Spider-Man are two different people. That doesn't necessarily rehabilitate Spider-Man's reputation. So you can have it where Peter still has the secret identity, and Peter isn't hated, but Spider-Man is maybe hated by parts of the public, and we haven't really explored that in a while. Yeah, because even if he can prove that, um, maybe people will still think that he ordered those drones to attack. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I think a lot of people have questions about how he was able to do that. My, my, uh, my assumption is he had one of those drones obviously recording that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And when, um, the boss of Scraps guy is downloading that file order. He's downloading the footage, and he's putting all of that together and adding in, um, like, a CGI version of Quentin Beck talking and saying all that. Yeah. That's, I, 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 I figure that's what has to have happened. Yeah. The, only, the only question that that brings up for me is then, like, he's got all the uh, sort of, like, he's got the little bits of blood and damage on his face in the clip. And he very clearly does not have that until after Peter like bursts in and like punches him. So that's really the one element of it that's kind of weird. Because that aside, I, I fully believe that like like he's he's like, I have contingencies, that's the contingency. It's like this is already set up. Well, I mean, assuming that he actually is dead and people find his body, they're going to find it like like how it is all cut up and stuff so um and like there there are multiple multiple drones in there that still have their cameras that were recording from different angles so true and if, uh, he's, uh, and if he's not dead he also has the out of like maybe his uh his crew came and picked him up before anyone could find his quote-unquote body yeah but either way either way i said i think it's uh it was a smart way to do it because it's not full on proof that he's Spider Man. So there is a way Peter could find a way to get people thinking that he's not. Yeah. I feel like you don't give yourself that out if you don't like firmly know for sure in the next movie that this is going to be the status quo going forward. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that said. I don't know, like, I get it. I've spent a lot of this commentary talking about other people's issues uh, with this movie and, like, how I totally get it, totally empathize with it. I just think this is a really, really strong movie. 
Like, it's one of those things where I spend a lot of time talking with people who really actively dislike it, and I keep expecting it to be like, oh man, is this going to be one of those movies where I sit down and this time I have that experience, and it never happens. Like, every time I sit down with this movie, I like it a lot, and I like it slightly more each time. So, I, I don't know. I think it's really great. I've never really had that with anything. Like, if I like something, I like it. Um, I will say, though, the one movie that I actually haven't gone back to that much, and it's, it is a Marvel movie, but it's one of the few movies in the whole franchise I haven't gone back to a lot just because there was so much vitriolic like, hate and discussion. And, like, months it's after it came out, no, it's not Captain Marvel. No. Months after, you know, the hype finally done, everyone thought it was suddenly cool to hate for Black Panther and say it was overrated. Really? Constantly. Yeah. All over the internet, oh, it's so overrated, or people only like it because it's, uh, it's the, the woke black people movie, or... Um, I think you should go back to it. I like it for the novelty of it's an all-black cast and it's focusing on Africa. I go back to that movie like, on the regular... I watch it whenever, whatever chance I get. Yeah, I don't think I've watched it since um, probably a week or so after we did that uh, strip review together. Wow, that was that was wild. You should that give it another watch. And, you should give it another watch and like let me know what you think. I I will. I'll uh, I'll probably do that while I'm on this uh, underlay, but it'll be like twenty days before the year for me. Nice. Um. So I guess I mean we all know what the post credit scene is. I don't like it. Um. At least not. I don't like it for the context of this movie. As I said earlier, like it just it undermines the impact of Nick Fury scenes. That none of that is actually Nick Fury. It's just Talos. But um. I I also don't know what they're setting up and what Nick Fury is even doing in space. I guess it's gonna have something to do with uh. Uh, the Eternals, maybe, maybe that's why he's in space. That's the only. I thought thing. it was. I thought um, it was obvious. But my first assumption was uh, they're doing sword. Well, yeah, that, but that that is somehow going to tie into the Eternals. Uh, possibly Eternals, possibly Captain Marvel two, even though that hasn't been formally announced yet. Just whatever space thing happens next. Yeah, which is Eternals. That and like, did you did you hear about um? I forget, I forget what the source for this was, and it might be completely bunk. But like, Eternals is going to take place over the course of like centuries. Uh, ugh, that sounds like rumor garbage. But okay, yeah, I haven't heard anything about that. It does sound like rumor garbage, but I hope it's true, because I yearn for a superhero movie that doesn't take place over like a couple of days. Endgame is the closest we have. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that. But uh, we'll see. But yeah, I, I don't have anything to say about this credit scene. I'm kind of um, I'm kind of on the fence about us even going through and talking about it. It's just, there's not much for me to say. Like It's fine. It's fine. Like it, it did what a post credit scene is supposed to do, which is like it's got me curious about where this is going. That's really all it's there to do. It served its purpose. It's fine. Um, and uh, well, I guess we can talk about how uh, well, then, um, like as oh, wait, we mentioned this at the beginning of the video, never mind. That Spider Man is back at MCU, even though like, we both yeah, yeah. We're, we're fairly confident that, that that would be the case and that they hash out some kind of deal to keep this relationship going. Because it's been immensely beneficial for both parties. I'm pretty sure that I'm not even sure how this makes sense, but I think I read somewhere that both parties knew they were gonna get back together before they even split. I don't know how that works, but like yeah, that that also time, feels like garbage. Time Magazine, not Time Magazine, but some, an actual credible source, like, that had, like, a whole expose about just, like, the workings of studios, and, like, it wasn't about 
this was like a footnote in it. It wasn't about the whole Disney Sony thing, but like that was a footnote in the whole bigger like this is the kind of stuff that studios are like getting up to and stuff. It's like these two basically had a whole thing planned out. Nah, you don't plan that. Yeah, it's it's weird. But uh, yeah, I mean as we understand it, that's not something you plan. But just... we're kind of spinning our wheels at this point. Uh, I, I, I said my piece. I think this is a great movie. I think it holds up to scrutiny. And uh, I don't know. Uh, unless you've got anything to add, I'm going to suggest that people let us know what they thought of the commentary, what they think of the movie in the comments. Uh, share this around if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already. And, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, joining us on this journey through Spider-Man land. You got any last words? Just that I really like this movie. Um, it was, like, I have major gripes with it. It may be the primary thing. But aside from that, this is a really strong Spider-Man film. And I walked out otherwise satisfied. Nice. So, uh, yeah, I think I might accidentally be locked in my closet. So I'm going to work on getting myself out, and uh, I will talk to you later. Thank you for listening, everybody.